All right, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, of course, depending on where you are in the world today. And welcome to this edition of PON Live from the Program on Negotiation at Harvard Law School. My name is Nicole Bryant, and I'm the Managing Director here at PON. And for nearly 40 years now, the Program on Negotiation has led the world in research, curriculum development, and executive education trainings related to the fields of negotiation, mediation and conflict resolution. And today we are delighted to have expanded our offerings to feature a series of these PON Live virtual events in what we've come to think of as our online classroom. It is a pleasure as ever to welcome so many participants from all over the world. We see that you're already putting where you're coming from in the chat. Welcome to you. Thank you for taking the time to be with us here today. For today's event, we have the great pleasure of welcoming not one, but two distinguished professors of law. Of course, our featured guest is Martha Minow, the 300th anniversary university professor at Harvard Law School, where she also served as Dean between 2009 and 2017. And she will be discussing her work, When Should the Law Forgive? And moderating today's discussion is our colleague, friend, and PON Executive Committee member, Gabriella Bloom, the Rita E. Hauser Professor of Human, Human Rights and Humanitarian Law at Harvard Law School and the Vice Dean for the Graduate Program in International Legal Studies. Professor Bloom specializes in public international law, international negotiations, the law of armed conflict and counterterrorism. And we uh, extend our thanks to her today for doing the honor of orchestrating this discussion. So Professors Minow and Bloom will be speaking for about 40 minutes, give or take, and then there will be time, of course, for questions from you, our participants and audience today. If you have a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, Q&A allows us to see all of the questions at once and allows other folks to upvote if they have the same question as you. Of course, as ever, if you have a comment, you can write it at any time in the chat. And I know we'll get uh, the following question, but yes, this discussion will be recorded in case you aren't able to stay for the whole thing. And by the time we get it captioned and put up on the PON website, you should be able to see it in about a week. Before I pass off the baton to our speakers, of course, I'd like to thank the PON staff members who made this event and all of our events possible today, specifically Diane Long, our uh, events coordinator, and James Kerwin, our assistant director. Thanks to them. And now, Martha and Gabby, the Zoom floor is yours. Thank you, Nicole, uh, and to all the PON staff. Uh, so it is uh, my distinct uh, and impossible uh, pleasure to introduce Martha Minow. Uh, she is, as you heard, the 300th anniversary uh, university professor at Harvard. Uh, a former HLS Dean and a longtime member of the faculty and also an impossible person to introduce in just a couple of minutes. Uh, Martha's scholarship spans more fields than anyone else I can think of. She's written seminal books, uh, shaped entire debates, won multiple awards as well as nine honorary degrees. Every prestigious uh, scholarly society in the United States boasts of her membership. Astonishingly, Martha's contributions outside of academia are equally staggering in breadth and depth. They are local and global. They are at the invitation of international organizations, governments, uh, NGOs, and academic settings. They're always in the business of making the world she and we inhabit a better place. So instead of reciting her too many achievements, um, I thought I should only emphasize Martha's most distinctive trait, the strongest motivation behind everything she does, which is bringing people together. So just consider these titles from just a handful of her prior books. They are Breaking the Cycles of Hatred, Memory, Law and Repair from 2003, Engaging Cultural Differences, The Multicultural Challenge in Liberal Democracies, from 2002, Between Vengeance and Forgiveness, Facing History After Genocide and Mass Violence from 1998, or Making All the Difference, Inclusion, Exclusion, and the American Law from 1990, or consider her direct involvement in the Divided Cities Initiative, or her support for the UN High Commissioners of Refugee Work on Rebuilding Post-Conflict Societies. On the most personal level, Martha's commitment to bridge building is evident to anyone who's ever had the pleasure of having dinner at her house where the, the conversation is always interesting, always flowing, 
always includes everyone. The woman can compel a rock to say something interesting. <laughs> it was a distinctive feature of her deanship, weathering storms from within and from without, and always trying to build the broadest possible consensus around every reform. And a very tiny anecdote that is kind of simple, but very, I think, uh, characteristic. Just last week, the faculty met with Provost Alan Garber of the university to talk about the university's COVID mitigation uh, policies going forward. And people asked all kinds of questions about masks and testing and uh, classroom code. And Martha, in a typical Minnowesk fashion, asked Alan, what did the university learn from the cross-school collaboration, the multidisciplinary uh, departmental uh, collaboration around COVID that we can extend beyond and going forward. It is who she is with her friends, with her colleagues, and with the world around us. So nobody could have written a better book on when should law forgive. It is with great pleasure and anticipation that I invite her to talk about the book and then engage with me in a conversation before we open it all to you for questions. Martha. Oh. Gabby, I'm so very touched by that very generous and thoughtful uh, introduction and uh, you, you, you model how to build from islands of uh, agreement to something much bigger. And I'm very grateful to PON for this uh, event. I am a fellow traveler of PON. Uh, and I'm glad you mentioned the Divided Cities Initiative because I'm going to start by talking about that. People came from 11 divided cities that are located across Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. And we gathered to exchange insights and provide mutual support every year since 2008. Uh, hosted actually by the University of Massachusetts in Boston, the teams from divided cities represented people in public office, people in civil society, people who actually were from warring factions for decades. And each group included advocates, educators, governmental, nonprofit leaders, students, business people, representing competing sides of longstanding conflict, civil, ethnic, religious divides in their communities. Some even disagreed over what nation governed them. One group from Northern Ireland said it was best to call their home Stroke City because the nationalists among them favored the name Derry and the unionists used the name London Derry. And so outsiders call it Derry slash or stroke London Derry. Participants at first questioned what someone in Lebanon could possibly have in common with someone in Northern Ireland, Cyprus, Kosovo, Iraq, Nigeria. Everyone came thinking that their own situation was unique. They had lived through violence, destroying neighborhoods, city infrastructure, destroying trust, and they all faced ongoing obstacles to recovery, reconstruction, and reconciliation. And that, of course, is what they had in common. Over time, they discovered that they shared so many similar issues as they struggled to create enough stability for children to go to school, enough reputation to gain access to World Bank funding, despite the snarled politics in their home nations. And over time, the former antagonists from the same city became colleagues and collaborators and even friends as they assisted their counterparts from other cities. The founder of the program, Professor Padraig O'Malley, uh, explained that people in divided cities are in the best position to help people from other divided societies. And he drew on his own life in Northern Ireland and his own struggles with alcoholism and family division. I served as a facilitator, but I clearly learned much more than I gave. Uh, and I realized suddenly that our own city, Boston, is a divided city, at least it has been, divided over legacies of violence, over court-ordered school desegregation and racial and class divides. Now, the United States is divided. The contrasting behavior of law enforcement uh, for the last for June, January 6th period and on is just one side sign of this. New questions about blame and forgiveness. 
my own home institution and others are engaged in soul searching about legacies of slavery unacknowledged in our midst, even as in the United States, school boards and legislators are banning discussions and trainings about racial bias and discrimination. Similar divisions, of course, with their own versions are happening around the world. Polarization around all kinds of issues is tearing up democracies from Brazil to India, from Poland to Nigeria. Americans report very low trust in government and in one another and divisive political leaders in many countries and many democracies amplify and escalate social and economic tensions and target racial, ethnic, religious differences. It may be that one of the few things we share is our sense of division. I turn to the subject of forgiveness several years ago, trying to think about what are the resources that we have to address conflict. The world has only become worse since that time. And I'm more convinced than ever that there's lots to learn uh, from such experiences as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, restorative justice initiatives around the world. The cost of mass incarceration in this country is one prompt for my work, but so is debt, individual debt, sovereign debt, and by forgiveness, I mean letting go of justified grievances. Individuals can do so in hopes of relief for themselves. Individuals can also seek forgiveness. There is often a religious dimension, but not always. And it is fascinating to me that every religion, every civilization, every philosophy has identified forgiveness as a human capacity that should be encouraged. Now, a wellspring of justice is the sense of grievance. So I'm a big fan of grievances. I think the sense of being wronged is how we know what is right and wrong. Grievances are vital. They're clues to injustice. They're motivators to pursue remedies. But harboring bitterness triggers pain and vengeance. Mounting resentments can even produce a kind of oppression Olympics, contests over who's more oppressed, who suffers more. And it's a hopeless task to ask whether spiking gun violence causes more suffering than mass incarceration. Hardening our divisions, we each think we're right. We all know in our own hearts, we're on the right side. Those on the other are wrong and we resent them for it. Nelson Mandela, waged a lifelong struggle against apartheid and he saw its peaceful end, he helped to produce it. But he knew better than uh, hang on to resentments. He said, resentment is like drinking a poison and then hoping it will kill your enemies. When it's carried by an individual, resentment can weaken the immune system. It increases stress, risk of heart disease, stroke, cancer, addiction, depression, aggression, Medical advice in recent years is echoing the religious and philosophic traditions by encouraging people to let go of resentments. But forgiveness has limits. Mass murders, rapes, abductions of children, genocide, acts that defy conception, not to mention the generosity of spirit required for forgiveness. Domestic violence. Sufferers face risks of trauma even being in the room with an abuser and the absence of a neutral decision maker exposes them to danger. In these kinds of circumstances, private or public pressure on a victim to forgive looks like a new kind of victimization. Nonetheless, forgiveness is a resource and it can be a resource, that's what I argue in the book, even for governments, for prosecutors, for courts, for precedents. They're really tough questions. Can a government forgive on behalf of its citizens? If a court or a prosecutor foregoes warranted legal consequences for a wrongdoing, does that jeopardize deterrence, respect for law, commitment to treat like cases alike? I've explored these issues in several contexts. I compare international treatment of child soldiers with the United States treatment of juvenile offenders, including gang members, and uh, look at the relative 
letting go of blame about child soldiers in many parts of the world compared with the punitive approach to juvenile offenders in this country. And at the same time, the emerging experiments with restorative justice here and elsewhere. I look at the forgiveness of financial debt, which not by accident, at least in English, uses the same word of forgiveness. Uh, and it, it's letting go of a justified grievance when a creditor forgives a debt, but it's possible not just in dealing with individuals, but also with institutions, with governments, for example. Uh, for individuals, medical debt, education debt, housing debt are mounting uh, in many parts of the world. And for cities and for nations, for businesses, it's interesting to me to see the legal traditions of bankruptcy and the development of loan forgiveness programs and even philanthropic efforts to buy up debt for pennies on the dollar and then forgive it. And I also look at clemency and pardons and amnesties. These are devices that governments actually explicitly uh, uh, accord, usually to an executive, to let go of grievances. It's a minor example, but it's very striking to me that libraries around the world are letting go of their tradition of fining people who have kept books out for too long. And this amnesty approach turns out to lead to many more people returning the books. So that's just the, an example, I know as mundane as it may be, of why I think there are resources in this idea of forgiveness. And I'm gonna turn to Back to Professor Bloom for your comments and questions. So it's only questions, not comments. <laughs> um, I think it's all so fascinating because as you say, it implicates religion and philosophy and what we think about human nature and uh, institutional nature or the nature of institutions. And I think one of the beautiful things about the book is that you don't, uh, talk about forgiveness as a guru or a preacher, you're much too uh, well versed in the evils and the fallibility, the evils of the world and the fallibility of humans to, to take that stance. I also very much appreciate the point that we shouldn't compel individuals to apologize and that's going too far. But you are looking at this interaction of uh, how institutions or the law particularly can make more room or invite uh, individuals to apologize. I want to ask you about this interplay between apologies by, call them institutions, it can be the collective government or the law, and apologies by individuals. And I wanna ask two kind of follow-up questions on that. One is you're hopeful that uh, the law would make more space for individuals. They would be more inclined to forgive. Isn't there sort of a counter concern that if, as you said, who are you, the government to forgive on our behalf or why are you not prosecuting to the fullest extent of the law? We'd be inclined to be less forgiving rather than more forgiving. Uh, that's number question number one. Question number two really has to do with the mental state of the forgiving party. And you kind of use these two terms, even in your talk now, the, the um, grounds for grievance and the resentment. And is it possible to forego the ground for grievance, not forego it, but sort of decide, I'm gonna focus on the bigger picture, I'm gonna move beyond, but still hold on to the resentment that is there. It's just I'm not acting on it. Maybe it's detrimental to my health long term, but that's my personality, you know. <laughs> what can I do? Uh, can, can we divide it up that way? So interesting. So I am not a very forgiving person, and I do hold on to grievances. Neither and it's <laughs> not just because I drive in Boston, but that is a part of it. Um, so I'm interested in both of your questions there. You know, I think that the temptation, and I, try not to fall into it, but I do, but the temptation to analogize the interpersonal to the institutional is there. And in a lot of the discussions of transitional justice, there's an enormous imagining that entities, nations can behave like persons and they, they're different and we have to acknowledge that. 
But I do think that there are interactions. So, you know, it's Moshe Halbertal, who's a great scholar, who pointed out to me and to others that interpersonal forgiveness often requires proximity, people to be close enough to each other to even see their humanity. And that got me thinking about what literally the design of courtrooms and courthouses, do they make it possible for people who are in opposing sides to actually have conversations informally or not? Uh, but I think that's really different from the question about when the prosecutor should say, okay, we're not gonna prosecute. Then it's not about encountering the other in their humanity. It's much more this collection of pragmatic, big picture analyses. Is this the best way to spend our resources? Maybe there's a better path, more cost effective to send someone to diversion rather than pursue the criminal process. Or maybe with bankruptcy. Bankruptcy is such a great example. You know, you can't get blood from the stone. The, the debtor, the individual, the company, the country that doesn't have the money doesn't have the money. Um, but maybe there can be a prospective development of a plan about you know, periodic repayments over time. And I think there's an analogy there for the, uh, even the criminal context. Um, you know, Maybe not with the most severe harms, but even some that are violent, there can be a prospective. Uh, let's, what, what can the amends look like? by this person and by others uh, who surround that person. Um, I think that the uh, interaction between these institutional practices and the feelings of people is very complicated. And yes, I do think that some individuals may grow even more resentful if they see that the government isn't standing up for their, their beliefs or for their harms. Um, and I you feel very strongly there should be, as you say, no pressure on the individuals either to forgive or even to, to support the government's decision not to pursue a prosecution. But often, you know, there can be some coordination. Uh, so, you know, individuals can feel, okay, I will let go of the resentment, but I want the prosecution to go forward. And I think that that's a completely coherent view. Uh, and I uh, have seen examples where that works well. And I think one other example you give, which um, I think is, is so powerful is the apologies by doctors, uh, that we know that um, when doctors do apologize to patients, the patients are less likely to sue them. The problem is that if the patient does end up suing, the apology is then used uh, as evidence, and that creates an impossible situation, impossible disincentive for the doctors to apologize. And right, one way of, of bridging that gap is basically prohibiting using that, uh, introducing that kind of apology into evidence. And I think that uh, it, it's a very sound, uh, sound advice. Um, does forgiveness need to be symmetrical? In especially when you think about these divided cities, less the concept of a perpetrator and a victim, but there is a uh, kind of, uh, you know, plenty of blame to go around. Uh, or should one forgive even if the other side does not repent or doesn't repay in kind? Does it still serve particular purposes that you would advise in favor of forgiveness? When I first started research in this area, the only library at Harvard that had any books on forgiveness was the Divinity School. Of course, yeah. That's changed. There's now fields, political forgiveness, psychological, medical, whatever. But when I started researching it, I did find there were really differences among different religious traditions on exactly that question. And there are some religious traditions, particularly some versions of Catholicism that actually say the godlike act is to forgive even with nothing on the side of the wrongdoer. No, no, it doesn't require a quid pro quo or an apology or anything. And then there are other religious traditions that have quite the different view that it's much more of an exchange and that there has to be contrition on the part of the wrongdoer. And even there has to be acts you know, I'm Jewish, so for me, the Jewish tradition is more familiar. Uh, 
And the idea that uh, for misconduct or sins between human beings, God can't even forgive. It's the human beings that have to uh, come up with uh, making amends before the apology is granted. So there are different traditions about this. And I think that that just shows the complexity of the psychological features here. Um, and cultural uh, traditions affect people's psychology. If you're brought up to believe I should become forgiving, then I will. You know, after the mass uh, killing, the shooting of, you know, parishioners sitting in Mother Emanuel Church in South Carolina, uh, several of the family members of those who were slaughtered forgave uh, the wrongdoer. Others were very offended, but the ones who forgave, that was part of their religious tradition. It was something that they had practiced forgiveness. So I think there really are different views about this. You know, I think that when institutions or governments forgive, um, there can be a quid pro quo. There can be, you know, conditional forgiveness. We'll forgive if you do this community service. We'll forgive if you pay these fines. But there can be unconditional you know, when um, two different presidents in the United States came up with amnesty programs following the Vietnam War, because, you know, thousands of young men actually were in jeopardy of criminal sanction, many left the country. That was a prospective effort um, and uh, to try to heal wounds in the nation, um, looking at the bigger picture. And I think it's so interesting that uh you know, speaking of international lawyers, apologies are in fact an, a, a recognized form of reparations on the international plane. And as a result of arbitrations or, you know, a court can rule forcing a state to apologize to another state. Um, and interestingly, we don't really have that in the domestic system, there are incentives maybe to apologize or to take responsibility, especially in the criminal context, but that happens at the sort of sentencing stage. In torts, as we uh, just mentioned, there are disincentives to apologizing. Should apologies be introduced into our sort of judgment phase and, and what courts actually order? You know, there are countries that have um, apology as a necessary part of sentencing and even physically require the wrongdoer to bow down, uh, to gesture in ways that indicate kind of uh, contrition. You know, I had the amazing experience of having the chance to talk with the commissioners of South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission while they were deliberating. And I asked them that very question. I, and I said, why, why don't you require those who are seeking amnesty to apologize? And I will never forget the answer I got, which was, well, then we will never know what was a genuine apology. Uh, and their very strong view was they could create settings where people could have exchanges of communication. But if it was contingent upon an apology that someone could get an amnesty and therefore be free from prosecution. There would be a lot of um, play, play acting. Uh, and, uh, and as a result, they did not require it. And there are a few occasions uh, on record of you know, people encountering one another and apologizing. But it's also, I think, came from the experience I learned from the psychologist who was advising the commission, Pumla Goboto Medikazila, who said that actually something that offended many of the victims of mass violence there were more offended when the wrongdoer coming in, applying for amnesty, would hold out their hand and expect to be forgiven, that they found that adding insult to injury. Absolutely. And I think, again, that there is a difference. I think there's a difference between compelling an apology, which effectively we do as parents all the time, right? We force our kids to apologize, even when we know it, yes. <laughs> there's nothing sincere about it, but as a matter of practice and forcing people to forgive. And I think that uh, yeah. uh, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned kids, because I think that we actually need instruction in how to apologize. 
I mean, we are filled in mass media with examples of non-apology apologies, where people say, well, if anyone was hurt, then I guess I'm sorry, or something like that. And no, we actually have to learn. This is a practice that human beings need to take responsibility, even if they don't feel it in their inner self. It's an important part of getting along. And you know, there's research now about large mammals and demonstrating how they engage in rituals of forgiveness as well. It's part of just coexistence. So speaking of coexistence, um, you started the book with a very sobering line of, and I think very correct, of, uh, you say ours is an unforgiving age, an age of resentment. Um, and you talked there and then uh, uh, today and subsequent conversations about the very poor state of the world in terms of how we see one another, how much resentment there is. Um, but I want to invite you to sort of connect another line of your work, which is about media and about platforms and about the type of information exchange that is out there. And the question is whether can you have meaningful apologies and meaningful forgiveness? Let's just focus on the forgiveness part. When we don't have any underlying agreement about the facts or the narrative. And so do we need to have a shared agreement about the events or the facts uh, before we can even enter that world of a meaningful forgiveness? Um, or again, I can forgive you for what I believe the events to have been, uh, but from, you know, my forgiveness is neither here nor there to you. It's a completely unilateral act because you don't share my understanding or my conception of what actually happened. Well, thank you for connecting different parts of my own preoccupations, and I'm learning something even from the questions. You know, I do think one of the sources of our polarization and division and one of the reflections of it is current media uh, and globally you know the rise of social media digital communications narrow casting the daily me we get different information uh, unmediated so there are people actually being paid to come up with ways to divide people um, it is a, a major problem i think and i also think that there is uh, now well documented, a phenomenon of um, people who will write something hateful online or make up a misinformation and do not experience that they've done anything wrong, in part because they are so many steps removed from the human beings who they're affecting. So this disinhibition effect is what it's been called, that the uh, digital communications actually uh, makes the recognition of the humanity of others less possible, less likely. I, I think that you're asking a really important question about profound uh, the differences in narratives, the uh, really the fights over what happened. You know, when, when we come to inner group and international conflict, the fight over what happened is the fight, the disagreement over the narrative. You know, I was once asked uh, when there was a UN sponsored commission on human security, I was asked to do a re report for them on textbooks and how they report national histories. And it ended up being a report on toxic textbooks that are war warring versions of what happened and, you know, different groups fighting over the textbooks then about what should young people learn, people in the same country being taught absolutely different views about what happened. Um, and so requiring people to have a common narrative before they can settle the dispute, in many instances means you'll never settle the dispute. Um, for there to be a, a kind of coexistence mode, you may actually agree to disagree about what happened. I heard though, I think it's not true, but I love the story anyway, so I'll tell it, which is that I heard that in Northern Ireland that people wanted to make a museum about the troubles, but they couldn't agree about what would be in the museum. So they had it with two wings and you went to one wing and you saw one story and another wing, you saw another story. And even if it's not true, it's so recognizable. 
But I do think that one of the very, very um, destructive natures of our current uh, media climate, so thank you for that question, it's been described by the RAND Corporation um, as truth decay. That there is a kind of decay in the even idea that there could be truth, even the idea that there could be a shared narrative. Uh, and if that goes and it's in real trouble, then that's the end of the Enlightenment. And look, the Enlightenment was a product of war. It was the recognition that 30 years of war in Europe, so many lives, die, uh, just terrible destruction required changing the fundamental beliefs, whether they were religious or political, so that there could be some kind of coexistence. And that in turn led to a belief, well, then we need objectivity. We need the search for the facts. We need to have some way to move forward even when we have disagreements. And that is what's in jeopardy right now. Well, can you move forward without an agreement about the facts? So, uh, you know, I, the, the, of course, the conflict I'm closest to is the Israel-Palestine one. And there is always a question, you know, we, when does history begin and what day do you start telling the story and how do you tell the story? Uh, and it's quite impossible, I think, to come to a shared narrative. Uh, and yet there is a question whether one could, again, not forgive that mental state that you're describing, but you know, follow the first punk, which is let go of whatever rightful grievance you have uh, yeah. in order to pursue a common good that is just a mutual interest of both of us. And we each keep to our own narrative. We don't fight about that. And we just focus on what would it take? Could you get, and I think in one of the questions I saw already, I think it's a great question that somebody posed, can you really have a kind of reconciliation or um, coexistence without that act of forgiveness that would it, it itself require an underlying agreement about what happened and who's at fault. You know, I was part of a project called Imagine Coexistence. We advised the UN High Commissioner for Refugees about ways to make refugee assistance less likely to feed into divisions and also maybe with different kinds of money and projects promote coexistence among groups that had been in conflict. And it was then that I really recognized that coexistence is an achievement uh, for many people. And it is may look like it's uh, watered down, it's less vigorous than forgiveness, but it is an achievement. And even to stop there and never move to forgiveness may be enough. Um, so I absolutely agree that it is not only possible, but in many cases, the best that can be hoped for is coming to some agreement that we will coexist, even though we disagree about what happened, and we will coexist for the good of the next generations or shared resources or what have you. It's, so it's often out of pragmatism and not about some inner change of the self but it may be a place that people can come to so that they don't have to hold on so tightly to the hate, hate and resentment. Because, okay, it's parked. We've parked it over here. And I know it may seem very trivial, but I'll give an example of, uh, I have sisters. I grew up fighting with sisters. Uh, and once being sent away from the dinner table, one sister and I, sat and looked at each other, knew that we could never forgive each other. We totally disagreed, but we decided to pretend. We pretended that we had come to an agreement and then we could come back to the table. And you know, it worked. That's a great story. Um, so uh, before I uh, turn to the question from the audience, uh, it is a PON event. Uh, so I'd like to invite you to think about the role of forgiveness in negotiations or advice you would have for negotiators uh, or teachers of negotiation. Uh, what should we be training people? And you already mentioned, you know, we need to teach people to apologize better. Should we teach people to forgive? And I'll say we, we, we do already sort of talk about empathy and the role of empathy, trying to put yourself in the other party's shoes, uh, 
uh, we do teach the fundamental attribution error that where, uh, you know, I assume that when I behave badly, there are a lot of good reasons for it, but if you behave badly, it means you're a bad person. Um, we talk about trying to focus on the bigger picture uh, and sort of, you know, even keep your mind, keep your, you know, eyes on the ball. Um, any other thing that you think we should be teaching students here or uh, giving advice to people who enter the negotiation phase? Well, something else that negotiation program in particular teaches so well, it relates to this last question. It's about listening. It's about being able to help uh, people restate what the other side said and what their interests are and what their uh, resentments are in ways that the other side recognizes. And, you know, if you, it, even though that may be too tall an order sometimes with international conflicts, I think that with other conflicts, maybe even international, at least being able to restate what the other side believes is going on is just an incredibly important tool. And therefore, a negotiator needs to be someone who can do that and who can promote that, listen really well, and be able to help a kind of communication that acknowledges here's where there's agreement, here's where there's disagreement, here are the two different versions. Maybe these are irreconcilable, but acknowledge there's two different versions and that each person believes it as strongly as the other person does. I think those are just incredibly important skills and ability. And to do so with empathy is of course very, very good. To do so in ways that actually then help to identify past, present, future. So where is the past? Where is the present? Where is the future? You know. Michael Ignatieff, who's a great expert on, on conflicts that have endured, particularly Eastern Europe, but other places, he says the problem in the former Yugoslavia is that you couldn't tell when someone was talking, whether they were talking about something that happened in 1660 or something that happened in 1800 or something that happened yesterday, because it was this agglutinated mass of it's all connected. So another thing I think negotiators can do very importantly is help people have these markers of time. You know, before you entered this room, let's see what happened. Now we're in this room, we're in a different space of time, and we're here to talk about the future. I think that's great. Um, and I think one of uh, these points about letting people have their grievances and still work together, uh, uh, I'm now starting to look at uh, your questions from the audience, so please use the Q&A function. So uh, David Hoffman says, you mentioned the corrosive effects of polarization and also the value of grievance, the ideal grievance as a marker, a very useful marker for right and wrong. And so how do we manage this tension between uh, supporting those who are legitimately aggrieved and yet healing uh, the, the polarization? I think that idea of separating, or I'll let you, uh, I think you alluded to it, but uh, you know, when I look at cultural depictions of forgiveness, it's hard not to note how often it's women who are forgiving. Uh, and uh, also how people who are in historically subordinated marginalized groups who are expected to forgive. So the power dynamic of cultural practices around forgiveness is something to really pay attention to. And again, why I think it's so important to say the sense of grievance is to be acknowledged and admired and sometimes important to give voice to and not to assume that just because you're the wife, you forgive, or just because you're the member of the disenfranchised group, you forgive. Um, but I also think that it's like one of the secret powers of the less powerful parties to forgive, because it's to claim a position of equality or even superiority to say, I forgive you. Uh, one of my favorite cartoons, uh, there's this minister receives this letter saying, um, I'm really uh, uh, offended by all of your sermons about forgiveness. And he writes back, I forgive you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, there is a very powerful kind of role reversal here where the victim gets to be the more powerful in having that 
ability to forgive, the power to forgive in their hands. Exactly. A great way of thinking about it. Uh, so one question from the audience again, what impact has forgiveness, uh, what impact does forgiveness have in the process of rehabilitation? Uh-huh. So interesting, you know, rehabilitation is the uh, element of the criminal process that has been so suppressed in the United States that we don't even talk about it. We talk about deterrence and we talk about incapacitation and all other kinds of things. But I do think that rehabilitation is a very important uh, goal. It's that future oriented. You know, sometimes with young people, we're not talking about rehabilitation, we're talking about habilitation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that I really encountered with child soldiers, people who have were abducted when they were eight years old. They never grew up with uh, uh, models of uh, good living and ethical conduct. So sometimes it's habilitation. Forgiveness can be uh, hugely important to people's sense of the possibility of a future. And again, with child soldiers, I have found talking with people who really know much more than I do, that self-forgiveness is for many of them the big hurdle being able to forgive themselves for the terrible crimes that they have committed. Um, so forgiveness is very, very important to that reconstruction of a self who can go forward. Yeah, and you hear that from Holocaust survivors, that yes. idea of, of forgiving yourself for having survived, that that Absolutely. is you know, a, a, a huge challenge just for survivors. Um, there is a series of questions here from people about specifically the criminal justice system and an invitation to say more about what kind of forgiveness we can see from the criminal justice system and maybe revert, you know, kind of go back to your, um, one of the very early points you made that there is, uh, how should victims feel about the uh, criminal justice being forgiven? So what can the criminal justice do to be more forgiving and the effects on victims. Great, so I actually have found myself trying not to even say criminal justice because we're so far from justice in the system in this country, um, most incarcerating in the history of the planet. Um, I, I do think that uh, when you look at our sentences compared to other comparable countries, we're three, four or five times as long a sentence for the same kind of offense. Um, we have a political economy that has rewarded uh, punitiveness as opposed to all the other dimensions of criminal law. I think that therefore forgiveness has at least two, probably more, but at least two different roles to play in the criminal law. One is uh, by the uh, actors who are in charge of prosecuting and judging, uh, deciding either to exercise their discretion not to go forward um, or designing aspects of their institutions like a restorative justice track um, or a practice of revisiting old sentences, which you know some progressive prosecutors are doing around this country. Um, but the other way, uh, of course, is the role of the victim. Um, it's fascinating to see uh, international institutions, the ICC has created a role for victims that's much more robust than the role of victims and survivors in most US domestic uh, criminal law anyway. And I think that there should be much more learning across systems to see what role can victims play. I myself though, am not a fan of victim impact statements because uh, actually making the length of a sentence or the seriousness of the punishment turn on the articulateness of the victim uh, or on how much they appeal to the decision maker is introduces all kinds of bias that are very problematic in my view. But roles of, of victims and survivors in having a contribution to the decision to prosecute, having a contribution in the decision whether to testify, um, uh, being able to, to speak and tell their story, I think those are very, very important and can be cathartic for individuals. Um, but not if they're forced to do it. Um, there was a question about their responses to the, the way the question was formed was specifically about Crimea, but I'll, I'll try and frame it more broadly. Um, a, a forgiveness for something that is still ongoing, 
right? And that you think is unjust and it, uh, unlike the sort of post factum, yeah. you know, truth and reconciliation commission when the facts are all, you know, apartheid, at least nominally is, is out, right. out the window. Can we forgive for an ongoing situation that we think is unjust or wronged us in some meaningful way? You know, I think about uh, people experiencing domestic violence um, who are asked or expected to forgive and put up. And I think it can be such a terrible cycle. Often the, an abuser actually plays with the psychological vulnerability by, by being uh, contrite and then being forgiven and then starting up all over again. So it uh, can be actually part of the abuse to, to have that dynamic. Um, and it, I've learned from my own work in that field that the critical first step is to say, is there a safety plan? Is there a safety plan for the person who is in jeopardy? Either whether they need to move or they need to have some kind of assurance that they will be safe today and tomorrow. Before that's taken care of, we don't talk about anything else. We don't talk about forgiveness. We don't talk about whether there should be a criminal process, nothing else. And I think about that in the international conflict situation as well. Uh, is there a safety plan for people? And if there isn't, how can you be talking about truth and reconciliation? How can you be talking about uh, getting along? Um, I think that the uh, issue has come up in many ongoing conflicts. Should they have a truth and reconciliation commission? And, and my answer is no, because you're still in a conflict. Uh, this is not the time to be doing that. Um, I, I do think that's different from how individuals need to manage the rage that can be uncontrollable about being in a circumstance. And for mental health, you may need, to, it's not forgiveness, but may need to put on hold, how will I deal with all of these feelings? Um, but that's, uh, that's a much more complicated issue. Does it matter? So we drew this distinction between somebody here in the, in the um, questions posed it as a thin conception of, of forgiveness and a thicker conception of forgiveness, I think, going to the question of whether you just relinquish or not just, but yes. relinquish the, 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 your full extent of the tools available to you versus this kind of mental state of foregoing the resentment. Um, and we're back to the question about institutions and individuals. Uh, whether institutions should develop a thicker version of, of, of forgiveness that goes beyond the I'm just not, and, and maybe it could take forms like, you know, rehabilitation or assistance or uh, expunging records or uh, things that you talk about in the book of all the things that we could do uh, to be more truly forgiving. I, I very much like this idea of the thin and the thicker versions, and they do have both resonance for the individual who may act like, okay, I'm not holding the rage, but still feel it inside. And it may take a long time, if ever, to let it go inside. Uh, and also for the systems. And I absolutely see there's much more than just deciding not to arrest or not to prosecute that the government can do. Uh, the government can create a whole alternative track, as I suggested, like a restorative justice track. It can also engage in proactive work to uh, pay amends, to pay re recompense to people whose lives were ruined, uh, even when they serve their sentences and then they face the collateral consequences of crime, which in this country and many parts of the country mean that individuals can't get housing, they can't get a job, they can't have a license to engage in many areas of work, they can't vote. I mean, those kinds of ongoing punishments, uh, the legal system is to blame for putting people in systems, uh, situations of perpetual disadvantage. So how can they ever dig them, their way out? And again, the analogy to bankruptcy seems to me very interesting, where there's a forward looking view. Okay, what are we gonna do? What's the plan going forward? And some, everybody's gonna take a haircut. Everybody's gonna give up something. Uh, and like in bankruptcy, I think with criminal matters, and often in international conflicts, we need to understand that there are concentric circles of actors. 
and to see that some of the proactive steps might be even more important for people who weren't the ones most directly involved, but the ones who were, you know, complicit or the ones who have the resources to do something to change the circumstances going forward. So uh, I, I'm very struck by an example of a man who engaged in a restorative justice process after he robbed another man uh, at an uh, automatic teller machine and the other man hit his head and he died. So he was prosecuted, the first man was prosecuted for uh, a felony murder because the man died in the middle of a felony. Um, and he engaged in a criminal process. He was prosecuted, but he also met with the family. And in explain, in hearing what the loss of this uh, victim meant to everyone in the family, uh, the perpetrator, you know, apologized, but he also said, you know, I've never committed a crime before, but I don't have housing. I was going to lose my apartment. I don't have a job. And I started to think about who's surrounding this man that he's in a situation like this. What are some of the other actors? A restorative justice process should include some of the other actors as well. So uh, people don't get in that situation. Right, and that's uh, sort of going back to the fundamental attribution area when you understand the situational circumstances of the person who behaved badly. Uh, I think that helps uh, alleviate some of the resentment uh, of, uh, and the labels that we put on people that you must be a terrible person if, uh, if you've engaged in a particular conduct. So understanding, I think the social, broader social context and the uh, kind of circumstances, uh, I think is a kind of useful, maybe necessary and essential part towards the forgiveness process. Totally, and another story, uh, this is a teenager in California who'd been expelled from a school. She goes to a new public school. She gets immediately into a fight with other girls who say that she has stolen their shoes. A mediator comes, hears from each of them. They agree to meet and the uh, offender says, yes, I stole the shoes. I sold them because I wanted to have money so my mother could pay for a blood test to show that she was not on drugs so that maybe she could get her other children back from the state. They were in child custody. They were in the protective custody. The other girls heard this and they didn't exactly forgive, but they understood. And they said, okay, you know, what can you do to make us feel assured you're not going to do this again? Uh, and, and that was exactly that experience of, you know, okay, it's a bigger picture. There are other things that are complicated. We don't think what you did was okay, but we understand. So it's also a, a great way to think about mediation and the role of mediators here. You know, if we, we try to think about the role of lawyers acting on behalf of a client, maybe in a negotiation versus the role of a mediator, you know, is, is there... It, should the, the effort be to try and get people in a room and see what happens, or should the mediator try to nudge people towards forgiveness just because it's better for their soul and for the relationship? Is there, can we give any generic advice here? You know, it's so hard to have an across the board view. I think in some circumstances, the best thing the mediator can do is be shuttle diplomacy, be in separate rooms. Uh, but in doing so, actually, one on one, say, you know, here's what's going on with the other person. And just to see whether that bigger picture helps move at all the sense of rage and, and grievance, but not to push for forgiveness, just to say, let's try to imagine why this is going on. I think that's something mediators can do often very effectively. And that is something that often in negotiation we're uh, preoccupied with presenting our best view and demanding, you know, responses from the other side uh, and not necessarily being focused on this idea of uh, either apology or forgiveness. And there's also this kind of concern that by forgiving them also relinquishing something that is very important. And can you sort of yeah. protect yourself against that? It can say, well, you know, whatever, but here are still my fundamental interests and you still need to satisfy those that the fact that I can forgive you for bad reasons doesn't, uh, you know. Absolutely. Wendy Brown has a book with a great title, Wounded Attachments. 
-hmm. you know, how many of us have an attachment to our wounds because that helps us know who we are and what our grievances are and what our injustice experience is. And again, I think it's very important to relate our grievances to a sense of justice, but not to define ourselves by that. Great. So I'm uh, afraid we're out of time. Uh, Nicole, do you want to take it from here? Yeah, I will. Well, thank you. This has just been so wonderful, um, really, Gabby and Martha, and such a pleasure. And this is a very actively engaged audience. And I'm sorry if we weren't able to get to everyone's questions, but really thank you. Uh, to everyone who participated and who was actively involved in this discussion. We really appreciate it. Um, PON is delighted to keep presenting events all throughout the semester. We have a series uh, of events that will be coming up. And of course, we're going to be returning to our in-person programming later in the spring. This is something we're very excited about, the occasion to get together um, for our executive education trainings uh, coming up in the future. So we look forward to seeing you either at another PON live event or perhaps at one of our one day programs or uh, intensives. And uh, in whatever way you continue to engage with us, we wish you a very wonderful start to the weekend, a happy evening, afternoon, morning, whatever is up ahead for you. And uh, thank you for being with us again today. Thank you, Martha. Thank you, Gabby. Bye everyone. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you, Gabby. Thank you, Martha.